are glad that you're here today as we start a new month. There are a lot of exciting things. You've heard some about it on the loop this morning. If you missed that, I do want to talk about kind of all the things that are coming up in February, some that were not mentioned, because I want you to prepare accordingly. I want you to be here. I want you not to miss out on all that God's doing. First of all, today uh, we're celebrating that this week small groups start back. Okay, that's great. Not nearly as many of you should be excited or as excited about that. So I want you all to find yourself, and that means intentionally going to the website or whatever and signing up to be a part of a small group. If you were here Friday night for the arena, men, if you missed that, I'm sorry. Pastor Robert did a phenomenal job of teaching us about discipleship. He didn't just talk about discipleship. He talked about how it had an effect on his life, being discipled. And then he also brought Mark Maldonado up here, who's one of our campus missionaries at Augusta University. And he's been discipling him for now five years. And it was an example of someone who's living a life of being a disciple and discipling. And that's really what small groups are about, a place to connect with God and with one another, to be disciples making disciples. And so we encourage you, beyond Sunday morning, this is how you continue to grow in your relationship with God and do what he's called us to do in being disciples. So get in a small group. They start back this week. It's going to be exciting. Also, the first collective, you heard that on the announcements earlier, the first collective of 2020 is going to be coming up on February 16th. Ladies, high school age and up, do not miss that. Invite a friend. Man, it's a phenomenal time. I love to come serve at that. What? 24th? 21st? Okay. February 21st, I don't know where I got, oh, I'm sorry, I'm reading wrong, I do have this, February 21st, Collective, there it is. Pastor Jim LaFoon is actually the one that's going to be here on Sunday, February 16th. Any of y'all remember Pastor Jim LaFoon? He's been here quite a few times. He's one of our leaders in our Every Nation family of churches, a phenomenal prophet in and of himself, and just encouragement that he's brought to our church over the years. So I encourage you not to miss that Sunday. And then the following Sunday, February 23rd, uh, one of my heroes in the faith, Pastor Russ Austin, he's the pastor of our Every Nation Church in Jacksonville, Florida, South Point Community Church. He's going to be here. Uh, teaching. He's been a spiritual mentor and father to myself and many of the pastors in our southeast, re- southeast region and really all over North America. And so I'm excited to have him here. You're not going to miss that Sunday. And then finally, but not least, this is uh, one of the most exciting events that we have here. We are hosting the Every Nation Campus Conference here on, uh, what's the date of that? It's the last weekend in February. So if you are a campus student, we're excited with you. Um, Yeah, our own Augusta University students will be here, students from Florida State, students from Kennesaw, students from UCF, and all the places are going to be coming here to be a part of this. And listen, if you're not a student, junior, senior in high school, but this is for college students, if you're not in that demographic, then here's what you should do. You should volunteer to help on that weekend because it is fun. And it's powerful to see God moving in this generation. And so, so you maybe never volunteered before, but it is a great way to sneak in here. And it is going to be lit in this place. I'm, you talk about energy. You think it's loud and crazy in here sometimes on Sunday morning. You haven't even heard anything. Some of you are like, oh, Lord, I ain't coming to that. Some of you want to be a part of this. I'm telling you, it is so exciting to see so many students just going for God. So that's coming up all in February. God is doing some powerful things at In Focus Church through you, through us together. But God has something special for you today, amen? You are here because God has you here today. Because of his grace, you're here today, and that's what we're talking about. We've talked about abundant grace, justifying grace, sanctifying grace, and sufficient grace over the last four weeks. If I could sum all of that up into one sentence, I'll do it this way, adding to what we said last week. God's grace is more than enough, that's abundant, to redeem you, that's justifying, and transform you, that's sanctifying, and sustain you, which is his sufficient Grace. So this is how you can remember all of these. God's grace is more than enough, abundant, to redeem you, justifying, transform you, sanctifying, and sustain you, sufficient grace. And thinking about last week, we talked about sufficient grace. I wonder how many of you realized how much of God's sufficient grace you are walking in this week, maybe through some adversity, maybe through some difficulty, maybe through some weaknesses, as we talked about last week. As Paul said, God's grace is sufficient It's made sufficient. It's more than enough in the middle of my weaknesses. And that although we want relief, and it's okay to pray for that, God has something better than relief. It's his grace. 
And it's in that moment that we can say, God, you are sufficient. You are all I need. Even in the middle of these difficulties, in the middle of this adversity, in the middle of this weakness, your grace is sufficient. And it's in that moment where he doesn't necessarily deliver you from that weakness, but his grace is made sufficient for you in that weakness that you become more and more like his son. So I love the fact that God's grace is sufficient, even in our weaknesses, what the enemy means for evil, and all kinds of things we could sing about, God's grace is more than enough. So today, I believe we will need God's sufficient grace to hear God's word and to apply God's word, to dig into a difficult subject that we're going to look at today as we cover this subject, God's enriching grace, or how God transforms our finances Okay, yeah, y'all are excited about that. I could t- See, I told you we're going to need some grace. You and me both. Lord, I pray for me and them. Now, there are probably more than a few of you here in this room today that would say, well, look, I do need my, uh, I do need my finances transformed, but it's only going to be if I get a grand infusion of cash that it's going to be transformed. But I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 11, and we're going to learn that what we really need when it comes to stewardship is not an infusion of cash, but God's grace. Infusion of grace. And the reason I say we need grace is because we're talking about money. We're talking about giving money. And whenever we talk about giving money, most people just shut down immediately because they've got all kinds of ideas about what I'm, you may have some presupposed ideas of what I'm going to say today or or how it's going to come across or what you've heard in the past and how it may have hit you right or wrong. The subject is hard, but just because a subject's hard doesn't mean that it should be ignored. As a matter of fact, Jesus said we shouldn't ignore this because your money and your heart are woven together in such a way that he says where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. What you value the most is what you're going to prioritize and do the most. So being invested in God's kingdom is not just about money, but it certainly involves money. And this is why it's such a difficult subject, because our hearts are so intrinsically tied to it. So the Bible has a lot to say about it. Giving is one of the righteous repetitions that we're called to do in this life. A spiritual discipline, if you will. What I mean by righteous repetition is it's the right thing, according to God's word, that we do over and over and over again. And we do this not because God needs our money or not because God's trying to take something away from us that we want, but because God wants your whole heart and he knows that your reliance and your trust in money is tied to your heart. So if this subject troubles you, then here's what I would say to you. No matter how long it's troubled you, the greatest fights are often fought over the areas that will give us the greatest freedom. The greatest fights, and I'm talking about spiritual battles, are often fought over the areas that will give us the greatest spiritual freedom. So if you feel like this subject is a fight for you, it could be on the other side. If you'll walk in obedience to God in victory, then you will have some freedom in an area that you've never had freedom before. It could be that God's word is true. And his word will help you. And I believe this is the case. So just a little bit of context before we read from 2 Corinthians. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 is really a big portion of the scripture of his letter. Specifically written to exhort the Corinthians to complete their promised collection for the Christians at Jerusalem before his next visit. Before he arrives, he's saying, hey, before I get there, you need to complete what you said you were going to do. Fulfill your promise for this offering that we've been talking about you giving to the Christians in Jerusalem. It was intended to help the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem who are going through some very difficult Difficult times, financially and particularly, for various reasons. Don't have time to get into all those reasons. One of them, though, was because they were Christians. They were going through some difficult financial stuff because of their Christianity and their ostracism that came because of that. And so Paul is saying, I'm coming to take up this offering that we've been talking about, so do what you said you were going to do. Do what you promised to do and give generously. So between chapter 8 and 9, he gives a narrative of what's going on. And then today, the passage that we're going to look at is the heart of the message, if you will, that he wanted to get across. And you can tell by how he starts it off in verse 6. Here's what he says in verse 6. The point is this. Anybody ever been in a conversation where somebody talked to you for like 
15, 20 minutes, and then finally go, well, here's the point. Why don't we just get to that? I know, guys, that's pretty much how you just communicate in general. I understand. The point is this. He goes on. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Verse 9, as it is written, he has distributed freely, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Verse 10, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. Verse 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Now here's a quick summary of this passage so that you can see Paul is addressing the different postures of giving. Different postures of giving that we all experience. You experienced just a few moments ago. As a matter of fact, let's just do a little litmus test. I'm going to read through these four postures, and these, this isn't exhaustive necessarily, but I think it covers it for the most part. Kind of four postures that it looks like Paul's addressing in this particular passage of Scripture. And I want you to see which one describes you the best when the bucket came through a minute ago. Like, which one describes you? Got to give. Well, here we go again. That's what I'm supposed to do. It's the right thing to do. So what dad taught me to do, got to give the money. Let's see if I can find my wallet before the bucket gets here. Oh, there it is, where it always is. Dad gum it. <laughs> and we reluctantly give. Ah, oh, man, I could use this for so. Man, I've got that bill. Oh. Got to give, though. That would be compulsion. That would be reluctance. Secondly, give to get. This means that I want a return. I am giving something and expecting to get a return on what I give. And this is oftentimes taught, it's not right, but it's something that we think, it's a mentality that if I give this, then I'm certainly gonna get back this, and that's the reason why I give. The reason, I'm not saying that it wouldn't happen, it's the reason, it's the motivation to give, is that I expect something to come back to me like it's some sort of an investment that I'm gonna get this grand returned on, and that's the only reason that I'm giving. That is giving to get. Then there is the get to give. That's the excited person who's excited about giving. Like when the bucket comes, they're like, yeah, hey, over here, give me the bucket, give me the bucket. I didn't see anybody doing that today. <laughs> Not a soul. They're excited. I get to give. I get the privilege. I have the ability, and I get to give. And then lastly, it's actually a level, a whole other spiritual level, and it's this one. It's the grace to give. The grace to give is a whole other spiritual level that Paul describes here in 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 8, if we go back a little bit, you don't have to turn there. Here's what Paul says in verse 7. But since you excel in everything... I mean, wouldn't you love somebody to say that about you? Hey, man, since you excel in everything, well, thank you. Ah, thank you. I appreciate that. Since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Excel in the grace of giving. So let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and let's start with verse 6 and let's break this down a little bit. The point is this whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. This is pretty clear. Here we see the law of sowing and reaping, also known as the law of the harvest. And you don't have to be a farmer to understand what Paul is saying here. He's saying that what you sow, you will reap. We often think of that in some sort of negative term. Them, right? You're going to reap what you sow. You better watch out. You're going to reap what you sow. We say that, and yet the truth of the matter, what Paul is saying is to the positive, to the good, it is just as true. You will reap what you sow. If you sow barley, you're going to reap barley. You don't sow like barley and expect to get apples. You, you reap what you sow. Not only that, the more you sow, the more you reap. If you sow 10 acres of something, then you're going to reap a harvest of 10 acres of something. 
When springtime comes around, the more you scatter, the more you gather. And Paul's applying that simple principle to finances. The more you give, the more you're going to gather. In the same way that a farmer who sows generously reaps generously, the more generously you give, church, he's saying, the more abundantly God is going to provide. Yeah, 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 but listen. If I give my money, then it's gone. I'm going to lose it. Here's what you go back to the law of sowing and reaping. No farmer ever considered sowing as a loss of seed because the harvest was going to provide the seed for the next season. No farmer, when they're out scattering seed, goes, oh, that's gone forever. Well, that's gone forever. No, they knew they were sowing in order to reap. Consequently, no sower begrudges the seed that he's casting on the ground. He doesn't try to skimp by with sowing as little as possible because that's not going to get the return that he knows he's supposed to get. He willingly sows all that he can and all that he has, and he trusts God will bless the sowing because he's the one that causes things to grow. With, and if he doesn't, If for some reason the farmer decides to skimp or just try to put a little bit out, guess what he does? He cheats himself out of the harvest that he was going to have. The more he sows, the greater the harvest he will reap. And the more he will have for sowing for the next harvest. So Paul's applying this analogy of sowing and reaping, the law of the harvest, to giving so that we can understand that plentiful giving will result in a plentiful harvest. And everybody's like, yes, yes. But watch, because this is where in the church particularly, it can begin to get off a little bit. And just a little bit can take us a far way away by the time we think that that's the only reason that we're giving is to get a plentiful harvest. And that's not the reason that we're giving. Because Paul's not trying to hawk some kind of prosperity message at all that so many people love to accept and love to hear because it gives us more for us to keep for ourselves. See, that would fall into the category of giving to get, and that's only going to yield a harvest of spiritual poverty. Paul makes it clear that the remainder of this passage, throughout the remainder, that God rewards generosity with material abundance to make it possible for people to be even more generous. So it would break down and be like this. The more you give, the more you receive. And we like to stop it right there because that sounds great. But actually, it goes on. The more you give, the more you receive to give even more. The more you give, the more you receive. Not to hoard, not to store up, but to give even more. And Paul is encouraging this as a lifestyle of generous giving, not just a one and done thing, because we like to do things one time and be done with it. And God looks for us to continue to do things, to be faithful again and again, the same things over and over and over again. Man, I've been doing the same boring things my whole life. Yes, I have, because I want to meet God in this place, and I don't want to miss him in this situation. And I want him to be able to bless my life in the way that he wants to bless my life. So I'm going to continue to do the things that the word says again and again and again. And again, no matter what, so that he can do what? So that he can change me and bless me the way that he decides to do so. If I'm in need, here's the deal. Shouldn't I hold on to it? If I'm in need, shouldn't I hold on to what I have? Not according to the law of the harvest. Not according to what Paul is saying. If you want to stay strong under financial pressure in this life, if you want to have something to show for your life that is eternal and not just temporal, then he's saying, by God's grace, give generously can't take it with me see the word generous in some translations appear four times between verse 6 and 11 generous means to be liberal in giving or sharing magnanimous i love that word magnanimous it's a greek idiom that literally means on the basis of blessings or a large amount of something with the implication of blessing someone else see generosity is the opposite of fear It's the opposite of tight-fistedness. I'm going to hold on to this. But the million-dollar question is, is how much is generous? How much is generous? See, the thing is, is we want to hold on. And what you hold on to is all you're going to have. But what you give, God is able to bless. What you hold on to, it's all you got. What you give, God is able to bless. This is what Paul is saying. So let's look at verse 7. And we're going to see that, first of all, what does generous giving look like? So how do we, what is generous giving? How much is generous? First of all, generous is personal. 
Paul says each one must give which indicates that he expected every believer in Corinth to contribute something to the offering for Jerusalem. There are all kinds of people in this church too, just like our church today. There are all kinds of people, different economic backgrounds, rich, poor, you name it. They were all there, and he was saying this. It doesn't matter where you come from or what you got. I'm not expecting you all to give the same amount, but I'm all expecting you all to give something. Even today, we can't give all the same amount. We don't expect that. But what we expect is that everybody would give. We expect that by God's grace, we would all be giving. A generous church sows generously. And Paul is saying, but some of you aren't sowing at all. You're not giving a dime. So don't expect the harvest to be bigger than the sowing. But if we're honest, isn't that just how we think in life? We want the harvest to be bigger than what we sowed. Like, that's the lottery mentality. It's the stock market mentality. It's the American dream mentality. A lot of times, how very, how little can I put in and still get a big return? How much can I put in and, and, and double, triple, quadruple my money? This is our thought. And we take that into the church. We take that into our giving to God. But when it comes to biblical stewardship, when it comes to generous giving, that's not how it works. That's not the posture of our heart. What can I get back? That's giving to get. And neither is it how the church works that somebody else can be generous for you. That would be awesome. Just turn to your neighbor and say, hey, could you be generous for me today? No, don't do that. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Man, I, I so appreciate you being generous for me today. John, thanks for being generous for me today. Thank you. I, I, hey, man, you picked me up today. I'll see who can pick me up next week. When it comes to biblical stewardship, every Christian is invited to give, and there are no exceptions. If a person or a household is going to experience the blessing of God, it will be a result of generous, cheerful giving. You will hear, This is what the scripture is saying. You will all experience the love of God because it's unconditional. God loves you no matter what. You'll all experience the grace of God. You're experiencing it right now. You're drawing breath. You'll all experience the mercy of God. Every single one of you has mercies that are brand brand new today. We'll all experience the love and the mercy and the grace of God. But it appears his blessing in this way is reserved for generous, cheerful givers who give by his enriching grace alone. Then Paul goes on to say, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart. Which means you actually have to think about it, plan for it, and intentionally prioritize it. Why? Because that's what you do with things that you love and are important to you. You prioritize it. You plan to do it. You decide in your heart that you're going to do it. One of the things that I love the most in life is going on romantic trips with my wife sans kids. Without them. Right? And and, Carla said, yes, yes, he enjoys that. And guess what? They've never happened accidentally. There has never been a time that I was standing in my house with all five of my kids and then all of a sudden found myself in the mountains of Asheville at a nice little bed and breakfast with my wife and go, how did we get here? Now what do we do? So the reality is that I plan it because I love it and it's important to me, so I prioritize it. I decided in my heart that on this date, at this time, we're going to get in the car or the plane or whatever it is, and we're going to go to this place together. And the reason why this is important, what Paul is saying, I decide in my heart. It's a non-negotiable. Paul says decide in your heart. Why? Because you will never follow through with what you don't decide to do. And I'll say in advance. And this goes with anything in life. Purity. All the things that God calls us to do. You're not going to do it until you decide in your heart in advance. That's what you're going to do. You plan for it. You prioritize it. Paul has been teaching them about giving for quite some time. And he wants them to follow through because this isn't a surprise to them. This isn't a surprise to them. And, and, And he's saying, this isn't a surprise to you, so you should be able, you're prepared, now do what you said you're going to do. Guess who it isn't a surprise for either? You and me. It's not a surprise 
that we're going to take up an offering and we're going to have a time of giving at church every Sunday. Now, if you're brand new to church, it could be a surprise to you. But there's not a single one of you that, that's, that's sitting there today that gets in your chair and all of a sudden you're just sitting there. I'm going to come over here and sit like I'm sitting there. And the guy comes up and you go, what's he doing here with this bucket? What's that bucket for? And I've been in church 20 years. Why do you have that bucket? Why are you passing it through here? Nobody does that. It's not a surprise. Listen, there are some financial surprises in this life, but giving to God isn't one of them. It's not a surprise. But if you treat it like a surprise, guess what? You will never give. So we do this repetitively each and every week. It'd be like you going out to eat today at a restaurant and them coming and giving you a bill and you looking at them like, I'm not ready for that. What do you want me to do with that? That's a surprise. It's a surprise that you got a bill for your food. Okay. And, and here's the reality. We have to do this. God's word teaches us to personally prepare and decide in our hearts what we're going to do when that time comes to give. And we do so consistently and generously again and again and again and again. And God's grace is abundant to do so. Paul goes on to say, give as your heart's decided in your heart. Give as you've decided in your heart. This means your inner thoughts. This means the totality of who you are. It's the same word for heart. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now you're going to decide in your heart about giving. This isn't some, giving is not some robotic economic decision. I'm going to give today. This is what I should do. No, it's when our head and our hearts come together or are both engaged, the totality of all that I am, and I give as an expression of my love and my gratitude towards God and all that he has done and given to me. It's not just a debit transaction. It is a heart transformation. And some of our hearts don't get transformed because we don't actually ever step out in faith and trust the grace of God to do what he's called us to do. And you feel gratitude towards God. You feel compassion passion towards people. You even feel a little bit of, God, you sure that's the amount you want me to give? I don't know if you've ever done that, right? I'm sure some of you have where you have this number. You're like, are you sure, God? Are you really sure that this is the number you want me to give? And here's what I would say. If you never feel anything like that, then you're probably not being generous. Next part, Paul tells us how not to give. He says, don't give reluctantly. Don't give under compulsion. We talked about that. That's the got to give oblig obligatory approach. When we do that, we basically negate the blessing God wants to give. God wants to bless, he says, abundantly as we do so with the proper posture in our hearts. So don't negate it by having that compulsory, obligatory, bad attitude, bad heart posture and giving. You might as well just keep it in your pocket. It's like me drinking a Coke or a Miller Yellow Zero while I eat a big hamburger and fries. I mean, who am I kidding, right? Who are you kidding? I'm not, I'm not just pointing at me, you too. Coke Zero, Miller Yellow Zero, and then I got 64,000 calories next to it. I mean, okay, I saved 180 maybe. You're negating what you're trying to accomplish. And we don't do that with giving. So he says, don't do it reluctantly. Don't do it under compulsion. But then he says, but here's how you do it. Do give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. Wait, God doesn't love me if I don't give? Nope, already established. God loves you. No, nothing can change that. His love's unconditional. It's not that God does not love the one who gives grudgingly or doesn't give at all. It's just saying that God loves in the sense of approves the one who is delighted to give to others. God loves a cheerful giver because that is precisely who he is, a cheerful giver. So generous giving is cheerful giving. Cheerful giving. Generosity and grumpy don't mix. Never met a generous person that was grumpy. And never met a grumpy person that was generous. Interesting. Because God loves a cheerful giver. And if you truly have a generous heart, your giving will be cheerful. And what we see here again is that the heart matters the most. The attitude matters more than the amount. Because God's going to tell you exactly what to give, and he's actually going to help you do exactly what he's called you to do. Great, then I am the most cheerful pastor when I give very little. Okay, well, can we have that attitude? 
sure, but it's not a biblical attitude. So I'll stop right there and I'll give you the reason or the how in verse 8. Paul says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. Here's where grace comes in. Here's where the grace to give empowers us to do what Paul said Christians should be doing. Here's what grace givers do. The grace to give comes from God. Here's what a grace giver never does. A grace giver never asks, how little can I give and still be cheerful? That's not what a grace giver does. See, grace givers outdo requirements. Grace givers outdo the law. The law, according to the Old Testament, required 10% of your income off the top. That's called the tithe, the 10%, first things first. And Paul's speaking to Jews who would have been doing this, who knew this, who knew the law, and all of a sudden he's saying, listen, what grace does is it comes and it supersedes. It goes beyond. It challenges the believer to give generously. He has a mind that's a gift that's greater than 10%, because it's a grace gift. It's going to be more. It's, 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 it's more. Grace is always more. Then he goes on to tell them how amazing grace is by using three all words, all, so that having all sufficiency at all things, at all times, you may abound in every good work. Why? Because all grace is going to give you all sufficiency to abound. This means you're content. That's what all sufficiency is. All sufficiency, I, Lord, you are sufficient. The grace to to know that you are sufficient. In, uh, when I have a lot, when I have a little, I've found what Paul said, I've found contentment in both. God, you're sufficient. So I'll have all sufficiency, when? At all th- in all things and at all times. That means no matter what I'm going through, no matter how much, no matter how little, no matter how bad, no matter how good, at all, in all things, at all times, indicating that even those, and he was writing to people that were impoverished. He, I mean, he was writing to people that were not just poor, they were poor, poor, like Dirt poor. He's writing to them saying, listen, no matter where you are, no matter what season of life you find yourself in, no matter what economic place you find yourself in, God is more than enough. His grace will be more than enough to empower you to give whatever it is he wants you to give. This is where grace abounds. You will have all that you need in order to do all that God has asked you to do. He never asks you to do something that he doesn't give you the grace to perform it and to do it. That's why I say, well, well, I don't have very much. It doesn't matter. That's why Jesus told the story of the widow's might, where the widow came up and laid down the two smallest denominations of money that you could possibly lay down. And Jesus said, she's given more than anybody because she gave out of her lack, while you over here who think you've done the great thing gave out of your abundance. It's not the amount. It's the heart. And by grace, he tells us to give and he provides provides us the things to give. See, if God prepared you to do good works in advance, he'll provide you, provide for you to do the good works today. If he prepared, and that's what his word says, he prepared in advance for you to do good works, well, then he's going to provide for you to do those good works today. If we're honest, the problem comes many times that we cannot distinguish between what we need and what we want. I don't know if anybody else has that problem. Man, I... I need this. And that's what we say to our kids. You want this. You don't need it because you got all that you need. Basically, it was food, shelter. That's all you need, but you want this. And we have a hard time distinguishing between needs and wants. Sometimes what we think we need is not what God knows we need. God knows what you need better than you do. And to be in a place where we think what we want is greater than what God says we need is sad. That's why the rich young ruler walked away sad. So the answer is we receive God's abundant grace to generously and cheerfully give or invest whatever has the greatest value in our eyes so that Jesus can have the greatest value in our lives. God, you are all sufficient. And this is not a health and wealth formula. This isn't, well, I give my money, I give my seed money, and I'm going to expect God to reward you with more. That's not what I'm teaching. It's not a guarantee that you'll never have financial challenges. It's not a guarantee that you'll never have to go without something that you want. Rather, this is a promise that assures us that God knows exactly what you need and he will provide all that you need so that you can do all that he's asked you to do, as Paul said, to abound in every good work. Here's the problem. I think we count on God's provision and blessing for work he didn't call us to. Sometimes 
We look at somebody else's life and what God's doing in them and through them, and that's kind of what we want. And so we, we expect God's provision to do a work that he's called somebody else to do. It's not there for that. Sometimes we expect God's provision to do works in our life that aren't good. Why don't I have this? Well, that's not the good work I've called you to. So when we know the good work that God has called us to, we can trust that he has every provision to do the good work that he has called us to. And how might that blessing look? Because this is why you don't compare how God's blessing somebody else or how God's grace is being poured out on somebody else because comparison will kill your heart. So how does that blessing might look for you? He might provide you with abundant finances. Great. He might provide you with abundant financial resources. Or he might provide you with wisdom and discipline to manage the limited resources you have. I know, I'll take the abundant resources. His blessing might take the form of a raise. It might take the form of a second job. It might take the form of extra hours that you weren't expecting. It might take the form of a spirit of contentment when things are tight. However the grace of God manifests itself in your life, and however God blesses you, again, don't compare it with how he's blessed others. He will provide all that you need by his grace in order for you to abound in every good work that he's called you to do. Man, I think there are so many good works in this church to be done if we would just look for God to provide for us for the thing he's called us to do and not for something that he's called somebody else to do. The simple answer was you might say today, well, how am I going to give like this? How am I going to give this way, this generous, cheerful giving? And in verse 10 and 11, Paul puts it this way, and I'll close. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Here's the enriching grace of God at work to enrich you, the giver. God, by his enriching grace, gives you what you need in order to be able to give the way he calls you to give. I mean, this is actually mind-boggling. The fact that you would say, well, God, what am I supposed to do? And then it's like he sticks the, the seed in your hand. Give that. Because everything that you have anyway comes from him. Well, give what I put in your hand. Okay. And then I do that generously. I sow. And then I reap generously. And then I continue to give. It is cyclical throughout the entirety of my life. The law of the harvest simply says that when you give generously of your money, you find that you have everything that you need. Not want. Need. The law of the harvest says when you give of your time to God, you have time left over and you're even more productive. At times, time stands to stand still. I mean, there have been situations, I think I shared this with you uh, when I came back from Cuba, but there's been other times in my life where it's like, there is no way that we should have accomplished what we accomplished in this amount of time, except that we were sowing our time for God's glory and we reaped some abundant time somewhere. I'm not saying that the sun stood still. I'm not saying that uh, that happened one time. I'm not saying that happened for me. I'm just saying that in that moment, time seemed to grow. And when you sow your life into others' lives, you'll find them opening up their life to you. The more generously the gi you give, the more abundantly you receive so that you can give even more, not so you can hold on to it or hoard it. See, God is generous. And he wants us to be generous. And what we do with the money that he gives us then becomes a litmus test of our relationship with God. Do we trust him or not? See, if we try to hoard and spend everything that we get on ourselves and try to hold back and have all those cushions and, and we rely on our money and we rely on ourselves, we become self-sufficient instead of God being sufficient, here's what we need to understand. That should set off alarm bells that our relationship with God is out of balance or worse, non-existent what our heart's tied to, we won't give to him. And this is what Paul says, and this is why he emphasizes in verse 11, the reason for it all. Here's what I want you to understand. I say, well, Pastor Brent, what, what are we teaching today? I want you to understand that God is calling us to be generous givers, and here's the reason. This is why it matters so much. Not so that we, we can have more money to do this or that. That's great. We want to serve in the kingdom of God to grow, but it's so that through us, 
it will produce thanksgiving to God. That's what verse 11 says. This generous giving through us will produce thanksgiving to God. When you give generously and cheerfully, other people are blessed. Others' needs are met. Other people come to know Jesus. The kingdom of God advances because when you give generously and cheerfully, people see God because he is cheerful and generous in giving himself. That's who he is. The reason God loves and blesses cheerful, generous givers is because that's who he is. We know that because of what he's done. We know that because of what the gospel tells us. It reflects the heart of God. It imitates the character of God. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Reflecting the heart and the character of God to a people who need to know him. God gave his one and only son. He gave his first and his best so that we could have an abundant and eternal life. For God so loved that he gave, and he keeps on giving. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gives us every good thing that we have comes from the Father of lights. He gives us breath. He gives us life. He gives us provision. He gives us whatever we have, spiritual family, natural family. The list is endless because God's supply is endless, and because of his enriching grace, it just keeps on coming. You can never outgive him. So the Bible teaches us that the God kind of giving is grace giving, which means all sufficiency at all times and in all things for all the good works that he's called you to do. And the end result is the receiver being blessed, the giver being enriched, and God's name being glorified and honored throughout the earth because people see the generous heart of a loving father through the generous hearts of his generous, cheerful, loving children. This is why we give. So just understand, when we don't trust God in this way, we're robbing people of the opportunity to see not only the provision of a good God, but the love of a cheerful, generous father who gave his only son. I want us to be known as a cheerful, generous church in every way, in every way, because we serve a father who is cheerful and generous in every way as well. Amen? You still love Jesus? Still love me? Okay, good. Just checking. Let's pray.